All right, so we're diving into the world of John Bonham today. Yeah. And you're here because you want to go you know, deeper yeah. than just the surface level. Right. We all know Bonham is this powerhouse drummer, you know, just the sound of Led Zeppelin. Oh, yeah. But we're going to use these Wikipedia excerpts that you sent in to kind of unpack mm -hmm. the man behind the behind the legend. Right. What made him so groundbreaking? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how a drummer with pretty much no formal training right. can become such, you know, a defining force in rock music. It really is. I mean, you know, we're not talking about some guy who went to, you know, a fancy music academy or anything like that. No. This is, you know, a kid who started banging on coffee tins and containers when right. he was five years old. Wow. I mean, I can't even imagine having that kind of rhythm at that age. It almost seems, you know, destined, doesn't it? Right. You know, from household items to a snare drum when he was 10 yeah. to a full kid at 15, you really see the passion building there. Yeah. You know, almost like he he willed himself to become, you know, this drumming icon. Yeah. And speaking of predestiny, I mean, you remember his headmaster's prediction? Oh, yeah, yeah. That Bonham would either become a dustman right. or a millionaire. Well, I guess he got half of that right. At least. Yeah, he did all right for himself, I think. I mean, that's the kind of story that makes you wonder if mm -hmm. some people are just, you know, born with this certain destiny. Yeah, absolutely. But natural talent can only take you so far. Right. <laughs> right. So who were some of the, the drummers that shaped Bonham's early style? Well, you know, he was drawing inspiration from some of the greats, you yeah. know, Max Roach, Gene Krupa, and, oh, yeah. you know, the speed demon himself, Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich. You know, you can kind of hear echoes of Buddy Rich's kind of speed and precision yeah. in in Bonham's fills, but but Bonham brought this, this raw, yeah. you know, almost untamed kind of power to it yeah. that was all his own. Yeah, yeah. So he's he's honing his skills. Yeah. He's playing with local bands. Yeah. And then comes this fateful moment when Jimmy Page oh, yeah. enters the picture. Right. So Page had just um, formed Led Zeppelin after the Yardbirds disbanded mm. and was looking for a drummer, you know, who could really match his vision. Yeah. And, and the word on the street was that Bonham was the guy to see. Yeah. He was playing with Tim Rose at this club in Hampstead. Okay. And it only took one performance for Paige and his manager, Peter Grant, yeah. to know that they would they had found, you know, what they were looking for. It must have been something really special to yeah. make that strong of an impression on, you know, Jimmy Page. Absolutely. We're talking about Jimmy Page here. The guitar god himself. Right. So did Bonham immediately say yes? Well, you know, he actually had, you know, other offers on the table at the time from oh. some Pretty big names like Joe Cocker and wow. Chris Farlow. Plant and Grant actually had to like bombard him with telegrams to get him on board. Really? Yeah. What does that say about his, his reputation even before he joins Led Zeppelin? Well, I mean, the guy was in high demand. Right. But in the end, you know what tipped the scales for him? What's that? He just said he preferred Led Zeppelin's music. Wow. Can you imagine what might have been if he'd, you know, gone down a different path? It's those like sliding door moments in history, yeah. you know, in music history that really make you wonder. Absolutely. So he joins Led Zeppelin mm -hmm. and the rest is, as they say, history. Right. But I think there's this, you know, misconception that he was like just a hard rock drummer. Yeah. And that's one of the things I find so compelling about Bonham. Okay. You know, he could definitely bring the thunder. No, no. question. Yeah. But he was also incredibly versatile. OK. Um, I mean, just listen to Royal Orleans from <laughs> Presence. Yeah. That New Orleans shuffle groove. Yeah. It's pure magic. It's fantastic. And then you have, you know, Fool in the Rain yeah. from in, through the outdoor yeah. with that infectious halftime shuffle. Yeah. Those are great examples. Yeah. I think it's about, you know, going beyond the like, you know, the stairway to heaven drum solo. Right. And really appreciating, you know, how much depth right. he brought to Led Zeppelin's music. Absolutely. But speaking of iconic solos, I mean, we have to address the the elephant or the whale, I guess, in the room right, here. Yeah. Moby Dick. Oh yes. Moby Dick. Moby Dick, the the drum solo that launched a thousand imitators. Right. Um, it's amazing how it evolved, yeah. you know, from a tribute to his wife, originally titled Pat's Delight. Oh, wow. Okay. Into this this legendary showcase of his skills. Yeah. We're talking, you know, 20 minute plus solos in concert. Right. Just pushing the boundaries of what you know, a drum solo could be. 20 minutes. Yeah. I mean, that's not just drumming. That's an athletic feat. It really is. It's incredible. What was it about Moby Dick yeah. that captivated audiences? Well, think about it. 
you got Bonham up there. Yeah. And he's not just, you know, pounding away. Right. He's using his bare hands yeah. to create these unique percussive sounds. Right. He was incorporating congas, wow. timpani, even a gong into his setup. It's like he's turning you know, the drum kit into yeah. this whole orchestra of percussion possibilities. Absolutely. He wasn't just a drummer. He was like a sonic architect. Yeah. And he even brought that showmanship to the big screen, you know, right. drag racing at Santa Pod Raceway. In, right. In the song remains the same during his Moby Dick sequence. Yeah. The man was a force of nature. Speaking of force of nature. So aside from Led Zeppelin, were there any other like notable collaborations yeah. in his career? He wasn't just a one band man. Right. Um, his drumming graced projects, um, you know, as diverse as the family dog's A Way of Life, okay. alongside Paige and Jones, of course, yeah. and screaming Lord Such is Lord Such and Heavy Friends. Wow, okay. And this one might surprise you. He even played on Lulu's 1971 single, Everybody Clap. Really? Yeah. From hard rock to pop, it seems like his drumming could, could fit anywhere. It really could. And let's not forget uh, his contribution to Paul McCartney's Back to the Egg album. Oh, yeah. Playing alongside, you know, basically a super group, right? Yeah, yeah. Members of Wings, Pink Floyd, The Who. Orchestra theme. Yeah. What a lineup. But we've seen Bonham's journey, right? From those early days. Yeah. Banging on whatever he could find. Yeah. To becoming this, you know, globally recognized drumming icon. Yeah. It's almost Shakespearean, mm -hmm. you know, this incredible rise to fame. Yeah. But tragically, his story takes a very unexpected turn. It does, yeah. At only 32 years old, yeah. Bonham's life was cut tragically short. Yeah. And his death wasn't just a loss for Led Zeppelin. Yes. It was a loss for the entire music world, I think. Yeah, it's hard to fathom the impact of yeah. such a loss. Absolutely. And, you know, Led Zeppelin, in a testament to his, I guess irreplaceable presence right decided to disband yeah you know we could not continue as we were they said uh -huh. which really speaks volumes about the kind of bond yeah that they had as a band absolutely and that brings us to his legacy right yeah and it's incredible to think that you know critics initially uh -huh. viewed him some even calling him like a steak and potatoes percussionist a steak and potatoes percussionist do you believe that it's incredible. So nowadays, I mean, his reputation is completely different. It really is. It's remarkable how his how his status has evolved. Yeah. I mean, modern drummer calls him yeah. the greatest rock and roll drummer in history. Right. And and that's not just, you know, nostalgia talking. Right. I mean, there's a reason his drumming continues to resonate, yeah. Yeah. even with people who weren't even born when he was alive. It makes you wonder what fueled that shift in perception yeah like what is it about his drumming yeah that has that has stood the test of time i mean well you have to start with you know the sheer power the, yeah. the precision <laughs> right but it goes beyond that okay it's the way he locked into a groove yeah you know that infectious feel that just you know makes you want to move it wasn't just keeping time no it's like he was making the music breathe exactly and he was a master of dynamics you yeah. know that ability to to build tension to create these these explosive moments right is is what made led zeppelin's music so captivating yeah, and let's not forget his innovative spirit. Yeah. You know, like the unconventional techniques right. and that willingness to push the boundaries of what a drum solo could be. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it really is inspiring. Yeah. Before we go any further, I kind of want to, you know, take a closer look at, at the, the tools of his trade. Okay. His equipment. Right. You know, he was known for that huge, powerful sound. Yeah. I imagine his drum kit was pretty special. It was, yeah. He um he began with Premier drums, okay. but later switched to Ludwig after meeting Carmine Appice. Uh huh. And um, you know that became his his signature brand, known for its you know really rich yeah, resonant yeah, yeah. sound. Yeah. They even reissued his kits in two thousand five. Oh wow. Which you know gave gave drummers a chance to kind of experience the magic of his that, setup. That's fantastic. I bet those are you know collectors items now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um. Besides the Ludwig drums, what else What else did he use? Well, you know, he favored Pace Cymbals yeah. and Remo drum heads, oh. known for their durability and, and unique tonal qualities. Okay. And what's what's interesting is that, you know, he wasn't afraid to, to mix and match hardware right. from different brands like Rogers and Ludwig. Okay. You know, to achieve his, his ideal feel and response. Yeah. You know, it just shows how attuned he was yeah. to, to every detail of his sound. He was crafting more than just 
you know, a drum sound. Right. It's like he was shaping, you know, an experience. Absolutely. So we've covered a lot of ground in this first part of our, our deep dive. Yeah. You know, his humble beginnings. Right. His meteoric rise. Yeah. The tragedy of his early passing. Yeah. And the evolution of his legacy. Yeah, absolutely. But before we move on, I want to leave you with a thought. Okay. What if John Bonham's story hadn't ended so soon? Right. You know, how do you think his music would have evolved? Yeah. What impact might he have had yeah. on the sounds of, you know, the 80s, the 90s, yeah. and beyond? It's a question worth pondering. It really is. It's something to think about. Absolutely. Welcome back to our, our deep dive into the life and legacy of John Bonham. Yeah. We've been talking about his, you know, his monumental influence on drumming. Yeah. And it really makes you wonder, you know, just how far does that influence reach? Well, we talked about, you know, some of the, the bigger names he inspired. Right. Like Dave Grohl, Neil Peart. Right. But but I'm kind of curious about the, you know, like the ripple effect. Yeah. Are there drummers out there, you know, maybe not as famous, that, that still carry that Bonham torch? You know, what's fascinating is that you can hear echoes of Bonham's style in so many drummers. Yeah. Even those who might not, like, consciously realize they're channeling him. Right. You know? It's almost like... You know, his approach to drumming has has become part of the, the musical lexicon. Yeah. You know, it's it's woven into the fabric of so many genres. Precisely. Think yeah. about it. That emphasis on groove. Yeah. The use of dynamics. Right. That That signature, you know, heavy drumming. Yeah. These aren't just, you know, Bonham trademarks. Right. They've become like fundamental elements of modern drumming. It's like he... He created a blueprint yeah. that, that countless drummers have, have followed and adapted wow. to their own styles. That's a great way to put it. You know, he didn't just influence individual drummers. Uh, he, he influenced like the way we think about drumming as a whole. You know, and earlier we talked about how some critics weren't exactly um, enamored with uh, Bonham's style during his lifetime. Right. You know, they found it too bombastic. Yeah. Lacking subtlety. Yeah. Um, do you think that had more to do with you know, Bonham himself yeah, or the musical landscape at the time? That's an important question. Yeah. And I think, you know, the answer lies somewhere in between. Okay. You know, remember, hard rock was still a, a relatively young genre. Right. In the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. It was loud. It was rebellious. Yeah. It, it challenged, you know, the established norms of of popular music and bonham's drumming was right there on the front lines of that absolutely you know that sonic revolution he was pushing boundaries yeah breaking down walls right so it's understandable that that some critics may be you know more accustomed to traditional jazz right or or softer rock right might have been you know a little taken aback by his approach yeah it's like any art form that challenges conventions right it takes time for people to adjust their ears their yeah. expectations absolutely yeah. and as hard rock gained wider acceptance and respect right the appreciation for bonham's drumming grew right alongside it it's it's a reminder that you know context is everything yeah what might have sounded excessive right or jarring in one era yeah can become you know, iconic, absolutely groundbreaking in another. That's a great insight. Yeah. You know, and it highlights the importance of, you know, approaching music with an open mind. Right. Allowing ourselves to be challenged by new sounds and ideas. Well said. Thanks. So we've we've talked about, you know, his early years. Yeah. His meteoric rise with Led Zeppelin. Yeah. The tragedy of his early passing. Yeah. And the evolution of his legacy. Right. But there's there's one element we can't ignore. Uh and that's Moby Dick. Right. The the epicenter of, of Bonham's drumming universe. Ah, uh, yes. Moby Dick. Moby Dick. The the drum solo that became synonymous with, with Bonham's name. Yeah. It's it's the solo that every drummer dreams of playing. Right. You know, the ultimate expression of, of power, creativity, yeah. and, and sheer stamina. Absolutely. And let's not forget, you know, these weren't your typical three-minute drum solos. Right. We're talking 20 minutes or more. Yeah, it's a testament to his incredible endurance. Right. Both physically and creatively. Yeah. And the way he he built those solos, you know, yeah. gradually layering on intensity. Right. Incorporating, you know, different techniques and, and percussive elements. Like, right. It was like it was like watching a master painter yeah create a masterpiece in real time. And that element of using his bare hands. Yeah. 
it's almost primal, isn't it? It is, yeah. What was it about that that technique yeah. that captivated audiences? Well, I mean, think about the sound. Yeah. Raw, visceral, almost like, you know, he's channeling some ancient rhythmic energy. Yeah. You know, and visually it's striking. Yeah. Here's this, you know, this powerful drummer. Right. Not just, you know, hitting the drums, right. but but becoming one with them, yeah. using his entire body to create these incredible sounds. It's like he's he's transcending the the limitations of the <laughs> instrument. Right. You know, like pushing beyond what what we think is possible so, with a drum kit. Know, Moby Dick wasn't just about, you know, technical showmanship. It was a journey. Yeah. An exploration of of sound and rhythm that that took the audience along for the ride. You know, I, I read somewhere that that his um his Moby Dick solos weren't always like meticulously planned out. Yeah. Like there was an element of improvisation. Absolutely. Yes, there. Yeah. He had a, a framework, a general direction. Yeah. But but within that structure, he allowed himself the freedom to experiment. Right. To react to to the energy of the audience and, and let the music flow through him. That's what separates, I think, the truly great improvisers from the rest. Right. It's not just about playing random notes. It's about having such a deep understanding of the music yes. that you can create something, yeah. you know, spontaneous and beautiful in the moment. Exactly. Yeah. And Bonham had that in spades. Yeah. You know, he could he could take those risks, push those boundaries. Yeah. Because he he trusted his instincts and his ability to to navigate the complexities of rhythm. Makes you realize that Moby Dick wasn't just you know, a display of technical skill. Right. It was it was like a window into his soul. Yeah. A glimpse of his his creative process. That's a beautiful way to put it. Yeah. And and it's why Moby Dick continues to to resonate with drummers and music lovers to this day. You yeah. know, it's not just about the notes. Right. It's about the feeling, the passion, the the raw energy. Right. That that Bonham poured into every performance. As we're talking about about Moby Dick. Yeah. I'm I'm struck by a, a certain parallel between this epic drum solo. Okay. And and Bonham's life itself. I'm intrigued. Tell me more. Well, think about the the structure of Moby Dick. Yeah. It it starts slowly, builds gradually. Right. Reaches these incredible peaks of intensity. Yeah. And then eventually subsides. Right. Isn't that isn't that similar to to Bonham's trajectory? Mm. He started humbly right. playing in local pubs. Yeah. Then rose to, you know, incredible fame with Led Zeppelin experiencing mm. these these explosive highs. Right. And then tragically his his journey came to an abrupt end. You've hit on something really profound there. Yeah. There's there's a definite symmetry there yeah a sense of both you know moby dick and and bonham's life encapsulating this this incredible journey right of growth yeah intensity yeah. and ultimately you know a sense of the the ephemeral nature of it all it's like moby dick becomes this sonic representation of his life yeah a reflection of his his passion right his drive uh -huh. and and the the fleeting nature of of genius and and just as Moby Dick continues to inspire and amaze listeners, yeah. John Bonham's legacy continues to inspire and motivate musicians around the world. Right. You know, it's it's a testament to the the enduring power of his artistry. It's a beautiful reminder that even though he's gone, his music lives on, yeah. carrying his his spirit and his energy with it. Exactly. Yeah. And that that leads me to a, a challenge for our listeners. Oh, I love a good challenge. All right. So what do you have in mind? I want everyone to go back and and listen to Moby Dick again. Okay. But this time, listen to it with with fresh ears. Okay. Don't just focus on you know the the technical aspects. Right. Try to to feel the emotions, yeah. the the shifts in energy, the yeah. the moments of pure unadulterated inspiration. Yeah. Try to to hear it not just as a drum solo, uh, but as a as a conversation between Bonham and his instrument. Yeah. A dialogue between a musician and his muse. I love that. Yeah. Because when you you listen to Moby Dick that way. Yeah. You're not just hearing a drum solo. Right. You're hearing the heartbeat of a legend. Perfectly said. Yeah. And on that note, we'll be back soon for the final part of our John Bonham deep dive. Welcome back to the deep dive. We've we've gone over so much about John Bonham. Yeah. You know, his his influences, his his unique style, that lasting legacy. Absolutely. But but as we wrap up, you know, our exploration, yeah. I keep coming back to to this one word. Pioneer. 
I think that's a perfect way to describe him. Yeah. He wasn't just, you know, playing the drums. He was he was pushing the boundaries yeah. of what was what was possible in rock music. Exactly. You yeah. Know? He wasn't content with just keeping time. Right. You know, he was a driving force. Yeah. A sonic architect shaping the sound of Led Zeppelin. Yeah. And influencing generations of drummers. Think about the way he approached the instrument. Yeah. The the sheer power and dynamism. Right. That that ability to shift from from a whisper to a thunderclap right. in an instant. Yeah. It was captivating. And his use of polyrhythms, you know. Right. Weaving together these these complex time signatures it, yeah. it, it added layers of rhythmic complexity yeah that were that were groundbreaking for for rock music at the time right you know i mean it's something we take for granted now yeah. but back then it was a whole new sonic landscape and for for those unfamiliar with the term you know polyrhythms are essentially multiple rhythms happening simultaneously which mm. which creates a really interesting texture and feel right Bonham was a master of this. Yeah. And it's one of the things that made his drumming so unique and right. and captivating. It's like he was taking, you know, the traditional drum kit yeah. and turning it into this this multidimensional polyrhythmic orchestra. Right. And and he did it all with, you know, such such natural flair. Yeah. Making it look almost effortless. Right. It's that combination of of power, precision yeah. and musicality that made him such a standout. Yeah. You know, he wasn't just a drummer. Right. He was a force of nature. And a showman, too. Yeah. You know, the the energy that he brought to the stage. Absolutely. You know, the way he moved behind the kit. Yeah. It was it was mesmerizing. Absolutely. You couldn't take your eyes off him. Yeah. It was like he was he was channeling some some primal energy. Right. This this raw, visceral power yeah. that was both, you know, exhilarating and awe inspiring. Makes you wonder, you know, what if what if he hadn't left us so soon? Yeah. Where where might his musical curiosity have, have taken him? It's a question that sparks so many possibilities. Right. You know, knowing his his restless spirit. Yeah. I think he would have continued to to push boundaries. Right. Maybe exploring, you know, world music influences. Right. Or even venturing into, you know, electronic drumming. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, it's almost it's almost too big to imagine the the impact that he that he might have had yeah. if his journey had had continued it is but yeah. but even though his time was cut short right. the the music he created continues to inspire and amaze yeah it's it's a testament to the power of passion right creativity and and a willingness to to break the mold it's a reminder that that true artistry transcends time yeah John Bonham may be gone. Yeah. But his his music, yeah. his legacy lives on. Absolutely. Echoing through the the countless drummers he's inspired. Yeah. And and the generations of fans who who continue to discover his magic. And that's the beauty of music, isn't it? Yeah. It, it has this incredible power to to connect us across time and space, to move us, right. inspire us, yeah. and remind us of the the boundless possibilities of of human expression. Beautifully said. So as we reach the end of our of our deep dive, yeah. I want to I want to leave you with this thought. Okay. When when you listen to John Bonham, don't just hear the drums, you know? Yeah. Feel feel the power. Yeah. The passion, the the sheer joy of a musician right. pushing the limits of his art. Absolutely. Let let his music move you. Yeah. Inspire you. Yeah. And remind you of the the enduring legacy yeah. of, of a true Drumming legend. Absolutely. Well said. Thanks for joining me on this deep dive. It's been a pleasure. Into the world of John Bonham. Always a pleasure to talk about Bonzo. Until next time, keep exploring, keep listening, yes. and keep diving deep.